Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left off with A.P. Hill, he had just graduated from West Point and was sailing to Mexico to join his comrades in the battles to capture Mexico City. When A.P. Hill set foot on Mexican soil, he was assigned to a cavalry detachment and ordered to join General Lane. When two wagons broke down on the way there, orders were issued for the men to stay with them until help arrived. Some of the raw troops grew impatient and urged Hill to push on. Several aggravated soldiers attempted to slip away, only to find the road blocked by Lieutenant Hill, mounted and pointing two cocked pistols at them. The mutineers decided to stay. Once he and the rest of the detachment made it to General Lane, Hill joined the battery he had been assigned out of West Point and received a promotion to second lieutenant on August 20, 1847. While in Mexico, Hill adopted a flamboyant uniform. He wore a flaming red flannel shirt and coarse blue soldier's trousers stuffed into red top boots, to which were attached an immense pair of Mexican spurs. On his head, at a jaunty angle, rested a huge sombrero. His weapons, hardly less conspicuous, were a long artillery saber, a pair of horse pistols in enormous leather holsters, plus a pair of revolvers and a butcher knife, all stuck in a wide black belt. By his own admission, Hill resembled something between a strutting bandito and a mobile arsenal. Near a small town, General Lane dispatched part of his army to attack a Mexican contingent, but Hill was left behind to guard the wagon train. After the engagement, General Lane turned his troops loose on the town. Hill remembered, the soldiers rendered furious by the resistance rushed through town, breaking open stores, houses, and shops, loading themselves with the most costly articles, rendering themselves brutish by the drinking of agua ardente. The women screaming and running about the streets imploring protection was a sight to melt a heart of stone. After seeing the horrible acts perpetrated by volunteers in the army, Hill thought of those types of soldiers in a different light, especially when he was expected to reprimand them. Around 200 soldiers were too drunk to get back to camp, and by the next morning, Hill and other officers had a difficult time getting them to resume the march. Hill said, my arm was perfectly sore from beating them into obedience with both fist and sword. Hill did get to fight, but on a small scale, and he did witness the hanging of guerrillas and bandits ordered by General Winfield Scott. When the capital was captured, General Winfield Scott allowed his officers to obtain quarters at private residences. When Hill and a fellow officer attempted to board at a woman's house, the woman caused an uproar about letting Americans into her house. It was found out that this was a sister to Santa Ana, and Hill conveyed to her that if that information was found out by others, she might suffer, so she would be better off allowing the two men to stay there. Ambrose Powell Hill became engulfed in the flirtations of Mexican women. He wrote to his father that, "'Tis a fact that the ladies of Mexico are beautiful, and oh how beautiful, but very few of them have ever read Wayland's moral science. You know my failing. Tis an inheritance of this family this partiality for the women. He even asked his parents, how would you relish a Mexican daughter-in-law? He became infatuated with Mexican women. He stated, they have more beautiful feet, small almost to deformity, and the sweetest eyes in the world, but they have not the pure rosy complexion of ours, the lily vine with the carnation for the rivalry and lips on which kisses pout to leave. The other aspects of Mexico did not gain his favor like the ladies. He declared the male population expert robbers and assassins, as well as beggars. This mentality toward the populace made him write to his family that, I believe they compose half the population of Mexico, and it has become a common saying that now we've whipped the people, we have got to support them. Beyond its people, Hill was constantly harassed by its insects. The night spent here will ever be memorable in my history, for the terrible attack made on me by an army of fleas and the great danger of my utter annihilation. In November 1847, he fell ill with typhoid fever. He battled with the horrible symptoms of fever, vomiting, severe headaches, and a total prostration for six weeks, but he made a full recovery. While in Mexico, Ambrose watched the national amusement known as bullfighting, but it did not sit well with him. I went to see a bullfight last evening and came away thoroughly disgusted with this great national amusement of the Mexicans. Tis a cruel, most cruel sport, and how the ladies can so defame those feelings given them by nature, as to look on with the utmost delight, cry bravo, and clap their pretty little hands, is a mystery to me. I have seen human blood flow in streams, 
but this turned me sick at heart. When the war with Mexico ended in 1848, Hill would return to the United States and be stationed at Fort McHenry in Maryland. Starting in the fall of 1849, Hill was transferred to Florida to battle the Seminoles. While there, he was appointed the quartermaster for the battery. He and the rest of the unit would chase groups of Native Americans into and through the mosquito-infested swamps of the Everglades and become fairly miserable while doing so. Hill wrote to his sister that, "'Twould be unwise in Uncle Sam to engage in such an expensive war as twould prove to be and only to drive a few poor, lazy, harmless devils from the country that no white man could or would live in. The horrible insects of Florida, like the ones in Mexico, haunted him. He wrote in his diary, My God, will these mosquitoes never satiate their vampirian appetite for blood. Buggy, buggy, buggy. There is no peace for the wicked, saith the good book. Mosquitoes were especially sent on earth as a torment to the wicked. Wonder if Noah had any in the ark with him. He did explore around his installation near Tampa Bay, Florida. On one of these trips, he visited an old woman's house with one of his comrades, went in and made ourselves at home, nearly split my throat bawling at the old woman who was deaf, and shamed my eyes looking love to her daughter who was confoundedly pretty. Wished to heaven that old woman had been blind instead of deaf. Moving through the dense foliage of western Florida, Hill accompanied a census taker and came to a small cabin with an incredible amount of children. My God, the eruption of the Huns into Italy would but feebly portray the living stream which gushed forth from the door to greet our arrival. While in the Sunshine State, Ambrose started to rely heavily on alcohol to get him through the day. One day after a long march, he had emptied his bottle and fell off his horse. Of course, he didn't remember that. His friends had to relay the story later. He remained in Florida until September 1851, when he was promoted to first lieutenant and briefly assigned to Fort Ricketts on the Texas frontier. His stay in the Lone Star State would be brief as he found it a rough place. He explained, I was in Brownsville but some ten days and four men were shot down in the streets. And this is the country to annex which both blood and treasure has been poured out freely as the rains from heaven. My regret is that these residents do not destroy each other fast enough and finally shoot out the entire race. The world would be no loser and certainly heaven no gainer. He wouldn't be in Texas long. Then it was back to Florida. He passed the monotonous time hunting, fishing, and reading. While in Florida, his mother passed away and he was unable to attend the funeral. But he wrote her a loving letter informing her how much he cared about her and wanted her to recover. She would pass away in 1853. He finally got out of Florida, but not under good circumstances. An attack of yellow fever incapacitated him. Lieutenant John M. Schofield and some other officers took care of him at Fort Capron's base hospital. Once he recovered enough to travel, he was to travel to Culpeper to recuperate. About that time, Schofield was transferred north, so they traveled together. But Schofield would be hit with a reoccurring bout of typhoid fever. Hill took care of him on their steamship ride to Savannah, then Charleston, where it was decided that Schofield would come home with Hill and remain there until well. Hill's father recommended a brandy mint julep start Schofield's day and the young officer admitted that his recovery became more rapid with that prescription. While Ambrose was at home, he wrote directly to the Secretary of War Jefferson Davis to be transferred to the U.S. Coast Survey Office in Washington. Davis granted him the transfer in November 1855.